Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to this uh, webinar dedicated to OMS, Organization Management Services. This session is being recorded and will be made available through the EMA YouTube channel. Um, a few introductory notes. So in the morning, we had a session dedicated um, to referential management services, as well as the EMA account management this afternoon. Uh, we're pleased to have a webinar dedicated to OMS. Uh, in addition to the usual topics that we normally cover about the principles on OMS, how we manage the data and the change request process, we will add new uh, topics and we hope you enjoy them. So you will be uh, hearing about an overview of all the OMS processes comprising data stewardship, data management, uh, as well as the service desk. Uh, we will share with you a little bit of how we are performing in terms of what activities we do and how we are adhering to SLAs. And uh, we will end the session uh, by covering how is OMS being used across projects and systems and give you a little bit of a sneak preview of what we're planning to do throughout 2022 in terms of uh, OMS activities. Throughout the session, please uh, put any questions that you might have using the Slido facility, uh, the link to Slido, the passcode to where you can uh, place your questions um, uh, is available in the chat. Please send your questions. Also vote on somebody else's questions if you would like to see them addressed at the end of the session. Uh, questions will be shown on the screen and we will try to address them as much as possible throughout uh, the webinar and we will address only a few uh, at the at the end of the webinar orally. The questions that uh, uh, we do not manage to answer, if they're left unanswered, they will be published in an FAQ document that is already available in the SPOR portal, so we will keep that document updated as we receive new questions. So on that note, I'm pleased to hand over the presentation to Deborah who is the OMS specialist. Enjoy. Thank you, Isabel. And thank you all for uh, s such a big interest on our uh, OMS uh, webinar. So I'll start um, with some brief introductions as well, covering some of the key principles uh, for OMS. So the OMS service uh, supports the implementation of ISO or IDMP in the European Union uh, by providing a single source of validated organization data and its uh, locations that can be used as a reference source in regulatory activities and other uh, business process. Um, the OMS system came to life following the need for a better organization data and uh, it was initially built um, having uh, as a back a background some five internal EMA source systems, one of them being Elder GMDB and uh, XCVMPD. Uh, and we are constantly completing our OMS uh, dictionary, not only by uh, bringing other systems on board, but we count with the user support to help us maintaining our dictionary, the currency of our dictionary by handle uh, change requests. So by now we already have a considerable number of organizations published and we count with your support to maintain them um, up to date. Um, starting with uh, the principles. So OMS data is hosted by EMA. We internally manage uh, the data and the change requests submitted by the user. This dictionary is, is accessible uh, and used uh, throughout EMA. It's accessible also to external stakeholders as our dictionary is public. Um, as I mentioned, OMS provides aims to provide a uh, central source of organization data, uh, which consists in organizations and its uh, associated physical locations to be used as a reference uh, in regulatory activities. 
an organization will be registered in our OMS dictionary as a legal entity. Uh, we will have one org ID assigned, one organization will be created as soon as we can validate that that organization exists as a legal entity alongside with all its physical locations within a certain jurisdiction or uh, country. So, for example, we can have um, in two different countries the same legal name, but because they are under a different jurisdiction, under a different country, we will assign a different organization ID and consequential a different location ID. This to reflect, indeed, we're talking about a different uh, record and for that reason we assign a different um, OMS ID. Any other names that may exist because we capture legal entities, they they can still be maintained in OMS, but they will be captured under alternative names, any business name, any trading as uh, option that you may have under the umbrella of the company, but the main record will always have the name of the legal entity. The organization data is structured uh, with unique IDs, so we never delete any ID. Even uh, when there is a merge, we maintain all IDs and they are all mapped. Um, they, they can also be mapped to source system in the case, for example, of Elder GMDP. This is the way for how the Elder GMDP consumes the data is following the mappings we capture under OMS uh, system. Um, an example, a very good example of this is, and uh, taking a step further, when we talk also about standardization, when we look at this example, we see um, a legal name. So we have an uh, an organization, we, we validated the data, we have the legal name, however, in one of the source system, as part of the name, we had some additional information. This information is not uh, part of the legal name, and for the reason, when we master the record in OMS, all these, when, and in this case, I'm highlighting only the ones that have the same location details, they will all be maintained and captured under the same record, under the same organization ID and the same location ID. For reference, we, we publish as well um, the source ID. In this case, we're talking about a site reference ID. So this is an internal key by searching, by query, uh, other GMDP, you'll not be able to find it, but that's why we have them in OMS. You can use uh, the OMS. The aim of the OMS is to provide a dictionary. There you can find everything, all the relationships. You'll be able to find it in the, in the OMS. Uh, linked with this unique IDs, uh, very important. Uh, one lock ID will be unique, even if the same, by, by chance, the same physical address is, is used by different organizations. What does this mean? It means that uh, in case we have, in this case, we have five different legal entities. They all, by chance, they all use the same uh, physical place, the same address, but all of them will, be, will have a different lock ID. The reason for this is because they are under a different legal entity. For the reason, a new uh, lock ID, a unique ID will be assigned because they both represent uh, a different relationship. We have this location that is under this organization. It's a different relationship to, to for example, this last one that is linked to a different legal entity. All these IDs are unique. You can use the lock ID to reference to find um, the correct legal entity that is linked to that, that is using that location. 
Very important. In OMS, uh, there is, because the aim is to provide the central dictionary, in OMS there is no differentiation between organizations that are used in human uh, context and veterinary context. As well, we do not distinguish roles, so we do not capture if we talk, if a certain organization acts as a marketing authorization holder or it can also uh, be a manufacturer. The reasoning for this is because depending on the type of regulatory procedure, we can have the same organization actually assuming different roles. And again, OMS provides a central source of organization information for that reason. We are not assigning those roles in OMS. This will be handled locally. Um, OMS does not capture any individuals unless, of course, those individuals are registered as a legal entity. We have cases as such. We have organizations in OMS that you can clearly see it's a per an individual name, but they have been created in OMS because they exist as a legal entity in a certain country. Um, other details that we do not capture in OMS is uh, granularity information. When we talk about granularity, we're talking, for example, departments, we're talking business units, we're talking uh, manufacturer lines. All this information will not be maintained in OMS because again, <laughs> we capture only legal entity types. Any detail, any further ground, any further information need to be maintained at consuming uh, system level. OMS have uh, versions. We're currently trying to have this uh, implemented in, um, on the system. Uh, but just to tell you that in a nutshell, the versions work does not work as version one or version two, it works as a version timestamp. This is something that we, it's, as we're speaking, um, the technical team is finalizing this and it should be, it should be accessible to everyone in a very short uh, period. Um, in line to this, OMS will always publish the latest version of the information. This means that uh, we ask not not we ask you not to submit a change request to retrieve an older version of the same data because by doing so we'll not be able to to proceed to approve indeed because of this because we aim to provide always the latest version uh, of the record linked with this question that we we are often asked which is who can change the OMS data um, as you as you may know, to change the OMS data, you as long you only need to have a spore access. As long as you have a spore access, regardless if we're talking and spore NCA role or the spore industry role, regardless if we're talking super user or a user role, you are not only able to change the data of the organizations that you are affiliated with, you're also able to change other organizations. You will only need to have one SPORE role to be able to add locations to a certain manufacturer, to create a hospital or a site that may be needed um, in the dictionary. You can do all sorts of changes. Now you ask, but how can you assure any malicious request to be submitted. This, we do it with the validation process that we have at the back end. User often do not see this, but um, we have a robust process at the back end that with the supporting documentation that the user needs to submit with the change request, this is a crucial step. When we have a change request in our system, one of the validation um, steps that we have is verifying if there is a supporting documentation. 
if there are, we will be able and to proceed with the, with the validation steps and verify indeed if the record can be created or not in the dictionary. Um, following this, uh, please be very attentive because OMS aims to provide a standardized list of organizations and locations. Those documents will be crucial to help us validating the data, but we are not going to create a copy. As, as I mentioned, it, OMS provides a standardized list and we have our OMS data quality standards that clearly states the rules that are going to be applicable at organization name and what and how are we going to manage location details. This document is crucial to help us validate the veracity and how um, is the name captured, not only the name, but also the, how, what is the correct legal entity, as well as the correct relationship with its address and uh, what is the physical location that the user need to have in the regulatory procedures. Um, now, with this document, uh, this document is crucial for the validation step as part of the, as I mentioned, as part of the change request process. We have two main steps, validation and standardization. So we do, we perform these two steps, both at organization and location level. Um, first step, validation. We use the supporting documentation, the supporting documentation provided to validate against the source systems. Does the organization actually exist as a legal entity? If yes, it passed the validation process and we go into the standardization process. We need to attest not only organization name, location details, and of course the relationship. This is why we use the supporting documentation. Once the validation um, is done, we go into the standardization process and for organization name, we use our OMS data quality standards where we're not changing the meaning of the data, we're just standardizing the way the data is written and added to our system. And when we talk locations, we actually have a major support from the National Postal Service. So all the locations that we publish, we publish with the local standards. So we will use the information provided by each and every postal service. And this is how we publish our locations with the standards provided by each country. And how, how do we do that? So we do this uh, because in our back, uh, backend system, we have uh, this address doctor functionality. This is a commercial name. So what is this address doctor? This address doctor is an address library that is used, um, is used to help us validating and correcting and last but not least standardize the data that we publish. So this uh, is a worldwide system populated with reference data over more, uh, with covering more than 240 countries. This is the only service that combines within a single engine uh, five global postal organizations certified. Addresses um, are formatted, of course. This is why we like, we, we use this system. That's why we choose it, because addresses will be formatted according to local postal standards, ensuring the correctness of the elements that appear in the correct field. So these reference files the files that we have, they are updates. They are updated uh, throughout the year, multiple times. Um, and this service allows us to not only to enrich addresses, um, but it also helps us uh, enrich them with geocode, geo coordinates. 
and also su uh, support different uh, character set and trans and even provide some of the for those that are recognized by this by this tool even provide um a child record a location because we will publish our locations in english you but with this system at the back end we are also able to publish the same uh, location in the local language um, moving on into our oms processes our processes are they they are combined we can say that they are combined in three um, major uh, groups one them uh, our data stewardship where we handle data service change requests and even other manual uh, work that we may we may do um, we have the service desk and we even have a data quality management uh, group where we we on a, an ongoing process but also reactive process we assure the data quality of the data that we're publishing uh, as a user as a oms user the way you have to communicate with our ema data stewards is by two different ways one of them via change request and the other one through ema service desk um, so the change request this is a is a fair uh, a fairly easy um uh, process we'll go we'll go through it in later on uh, in this presentation when we talk service desk we have different categorizations of the issues or the questions that are that can be placed in our in our service uh, we can handle uh, four groups uh, of service test calls, data quality incidents, data quality questions, even a few IT incidents um, and other questions that when due to the lack of awareness of the system, we will also provide further assistance uh, to the user. When we talk data quality incidents, this is crucial to integrate with our SPORE key user group our sport queues a group i'll show you as well <laughs> later on a few more information on this group and exactly the functions of this group are in our oms uh, processes but mainly um, they help us improving our processes working with our data quality issues that we find if there is a need to create or to review any business rule they have been a major help in constructing and updating, improving some of our guidances. Um, so now that we've seen everything that is happening at uh, OMS level, um, what what the, the what is the share that each of these activity represent? How many requests do we handle a month? So now going into the statistics, just to show you a high level of the difference and the evolution uh, since two years ago till uh, last year we had a significant increase on our uh, dictionary global uh, numbers this increase was uh, due to upcoming mandate use of OMS so uh, in uh, last year uh, we had uh, the mandate to use implemented uh, in EAF for centralized procedures and as well the as preparation as part of the preparation of the the mandate to use in UPD, other GMDP and CTIS hence this um, this difference on on the numbers starting with the tasks that we've we've seen that this is the tasks that the the, the gate one of the gateways that we have to to communicate with our user with it which is the the change request um, these tasks have a big visibility and of course a direct impact on current uh, regulatory procedures um, we went live uh, five years ago 
and through since since then we have been improving our process not only the process but the number of tasks that we we handle a, a year especially a significant increase of almost 200% from 2020 to 21 this as i as i mentioned in a previous slide was mainly due to the mandate use of OMS for centralized procedures and as preparation uh, for the upcoming mandate of OMS in three other systems. Um, but even though with this, uh, with this increase in almost uh, three times more than comparing with the previous year, um, we we were able to maintain um our our slas so even though at the beginning we didn't have a very good start but uh with the time and uh with the with the better structure of the system we were able to to reach uh an sla of 99% we've reached this value in 2020 last year even with this increase we main, we were able to maintain within the same uh, within the same slas and because our priority uh, is always to make everyone's life easier um and always to continue the constant improvement of the customer uh, experience uh, we had a uh, majority of our uh, change requests they were approved uh, last year uh, we felt we were able last year we were able to reduce the number of rejected rejected change requests from 48 percent which was captured in 2020 into 30 33 percent so um this was this was done with the support of key user group uh, with we did a major improvement of our manuals of our guidance and with 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 this we feel that this significant de decrease um was clearly uh, notorious um we we would like to continue with this reduction uh, because as i mentioned is a necessary work not only to the requester but also to our internal team and in in vision to this uh, for this year, we are planning to implement a new functionality, a simple warning message that every time, and this is linked also <coughs> to the numbers from the previous year, because we see that more than half of our change requests are rejected due to the missing supporting documentation. Hence, this new proposal of new functionality where we'll see a warning every time a change request is submitted without supporting documentation, a warning message will be popped up uh, to remind the user that this document is very is crucial on the validation uh, process. So we've seen we've seen uh, the the change requests, um, but. When we look, we see indeed a high level, a high number of change requests that were submitted last year. However, when we compare with, for example, our data service, the other scope of tasks that we perform, we have the change requests are a fairly small part of the whole tasks that we performed last year. So change requests is just a 10 of the data services, for example, uh, the tasks that we performed last year. So this increase, um, this, this is, as I mentioned, a 10 of, of the change requests. Um, in, this, uh, in this scope, we also increase uh, Comparis comparing between 20 to 21, we had an increase of almost 350%, so a significant increase. This was uh, due to the integration preparation for the integration with the other GMDP, where we did, we did a, 
a major cleansing in a very short period of time as far as part of the preparation for the integration with with uh, EUPD and uh, last but not least uh, the maintenance of our data quality um, of our data quality uh, through uh, data profiling this is something that will I'll uh, we'll see it later in this presentation as well. So just as a note that OMS is constantly being updated. So for right now, the data is a non-static data that we have there because the rules may change and we try to keep them up to date. But our focus right now was to within, integrate with the upcoming metadata of the data and as of this year, our priority will be um, making sure that we have uh, our data following our data quality uh, standards. When we look at the, the full picture, we still have we saw our data services, we saw our change requests, we still have a small fair <laughs> of services and tasks being performed, is, even though um, if, in, we didn't notice a, um, a proportional increase comparing with change requests and data service activity. We, we still had an increase between 20 uh, and 21, an increase of 135%. Uh, and this increase, um, this increase, uh, we were able to, even with this small increase, it's still <laughs> more uh, tasks for us to handle. And even though we were able to meet our, our SLAs, of course, not, um, within the, the, the acceptable average. We had a slight decrease comparing with 2020. This was due to the beginning of the year. We had a major system upgrade where we had a um, considerable number of IT uh, incidents reported. Our team, our technical team was, the resources were all focused in, indeed in, in implementing this uh, upgrade uh, and for that we we see it we noticed that there was a decrease on on our statistics on our statistics but uh, when we look at the final outcome it's still within uh, the established and our average uh, service level agreements. <laughs> Uh, when we see uh, the frequency, uh, the frequency of data quality incidents, and comparing not only with our with our whole dictionary, but also the frequency of those data that those data quality incidents happen per user, we we have a fairly small number uh, in percentage, uh, both for uh, the difference between. The, the full dictionary and the users. Um, at the end of last year, we did uh, a customer satisfaction survey. And from this one, we also uh, got very good results. The outcome of this survey, survey with more than 200 responses, um, where in f both for data services and data quality, we had uh, more than 90% uh, of our customers classified and assign a satisfactory uh, note to both our services and uh, data quality uh, performed. Now, going to the other, uh, one of the other uh, processes that we have, our OMS data quality management, um, how do we maintain uh, a high quality of our information and what are the processes we have in place to assure 
that we maintain and how do we how does this happen in reality so we do it in two main ways one proactive and a more reactive way so this reactive way um, is done mainly through service desk where the user uh, reports a data quality incident uh, in a more proactive way so to hold the tasks that we we've done either data stewardship or um, even ser service service desk we do um, an active base monitoring so to all the tasks we perform we do a sample of 20 percent of those tasks that were performed we we review them we see if there were any any errors or not um, and after that we do another 20 percent uh, of quality assurance and is with this quality assurance that help us uh, identify any any hiccups in our process that we we do an assessment and we see that there may be a way for improve in our processes um, we identify root causes and try to prevent them um, as well in case we we see that there are some rules that we may be missing something that we do not have in our data data quality rules, all those will be captured under um, a small report, a different report that we have as we capture the data, as we call it data quality defect. Another way of reporting those is in another way, another proactive way um, is a database monitor. Uh, so we do this through our data profiling. So this data profiling is no more than uh, a dashboard where it assesses all our dictionary and it, is, uh, it basically review the data and see uh, what, is, what data is not compliant with our data quality uh, rules. Um, through all these three major processes. They all go in case we, we find something that it needs further investigation. Um, we will, cap as I said, we'll capture under um, this data quality defects and we'll try to understand, to further investigate uh, what what's happening <laughs> and what can we do in order to prevent them from happening. All these, all these uh, errors that may be identified in, in all these three major um, groups, they, they will be assigned every time we find an error. There is a categorization of those errors. Is it a duplicate? If it's a duplicate, it's considered a major error. If it's a, an inconsistent uh, or a hiccup when we master the data that it does not affect um, the record itself, we consider a minor a minor error. And for last year, uh, what what have we encountered? Uh, how does this actually work uh, in in reality? When, for example, for a service desk. We found uh, 78 incidents. Um, apart from these is incidents, because they are all handled, uh, we did uh, an audit of 137 calls, to which of them we find two major. Um, th but those two majors, they were uh, due to the missing supporting material. This is depending on the way uh, we actually classify them. But we we classify them as majors because if we miss, if by any chance, uh, we miss uh, supporting documentation, this will lead, uh, is not providing a good customer service. The user will still have more questions. So we consider as uh, not 100% uh, fulfilled. Um, but when we look at, at the big picture, service, when we look at volume, service desk, was the one that had a lower volume, and the same happened as well at uh, 
data quality uh, level. The numbers are, of course, proportional. They are 20% of all the tasks that are performed, but even though um, they are still uh, within the, the acceptable thresholds, all these errors that are visible that we find, we correct them immediately. Uh, any data quality defect that we may find, we capture in that separate uh, record and we take the discussion to our SPORE uh, key user group. In this group, um, we, we aim to discuss and to uh, explore the possibility of the creation of the new rule in case we see that there's something that hasn't been that is not clear and in case we I, we even identify that there is indeed a record that uh, it need to be taken as an exception and we may have in more in the future and we need to prepare for that so we need to make sure we have all those rules there another proactive way that we saw in the previous slide uh, which is the data uh, profiling. So uh, those profiles, as I mentioned, they are built um, to compare the data that we have against our business rule and to identify any hiccups, any discrepancy between those. So this is a constant monitoring and development uh, activity. Um, and uh, link with those data quality defects that we saw. Every time the key user group decides to publish a new business rule, we will update our data quality standards, we will publish the new rule, and we'll need, of course, to monitor, to create a new, pro a new profile to make sure uh, that rule is being followed and uh, we do not create anything that goes outside <coughs> that rule. Um, an example of uh, those dashboards that we have, um, we I'd like to share here with you uh, a scorecard that we have for location uh, on data quality. So in this case, we have a full uh, list of profiles already put together in our system. We identify uh, already some errors. As, as you can see here, we have uh, for our Irish addresses, we have a fairly uh, a significant number of locations that need review. So how are we going to prioritize the work? So the work is prioritized following a color order. So the reds, uh, they're going to be our next priority. After this, there is a yellow, uh, a, a mid uh, threshold. And last but not least, we will review all the greens until all of them reach um, the score of 100, which means that there are no invalid rows identified. In this case, um, to share with you a different, another scorecard that we have on organization duplicates. In this case, uh, this is one of those that we monitor daily. We go into our system, we, we've, we rerun all these scorecards and we try to keep an eye on them so that we don't have specially on duplicates because it's a major error. If we identify, we need to to capture them and to um, and to correct them immediately. Um, as I said, to every rule uh, we add uh, to our profiling, we will uh, assign a certain data quality attribute. So we have a small group, small threshold of uh, those rule, all those rules that we capture on our data quality uh, standards. But the goal, uh, a high level overview of the quality, we always like to uh, keep an eye on this high level overview. We've captured uh, 
five major data quality attributes and to all of those we try to put them inside of one of these attributes to assure and to look at the quality of our uh, dictionary both at organization and location level. Now uh, going into the change request, one of the gateways that the user use uh, to update our dictionary and to get in touch uh, with us. So in, in a nutshell, uh, the request um, can submit all sorts of change requests to our dictionary. There is a, a three-step approval uh, for, for the change request. We have the first step which is the submission, the requester go to our portal and submit the changes, the relevant changes, either to other organization, to other location, or to update any of the current uh, records that we have, always never forgetting one of the requirements to provide the supporting documentation, crucial to our next step, to our validation process, so that we can attest the veracity and verify that that organization actually exists as a legal as a legal entity and to display to uh, test the veracity of the relationship between organization and the location uh, that we're trying to create uh, after the validation not to forget the the second step very important the standardization process that we use our OMS data quality standards to make sure um, we have a standardized list of organization and location details. The last but not least, the approval or rejection step, so the outcome of the change request. Um, so, and only two outcomes can occur. The change request can either be approved and the data will be automatically published in the dictionary or the change request can, can be rejected, rejected in case any of the requirements uh, have not been fulfilled. Um, in any case, the user will always receive uh, a small explanation in case it's applicable, a short guidance on further steps to have a successfully change request approved in our uh, dictionary. Um, depending on the type of uh, change request the user is submitting, we, we have different uh, service level agreements uh, because when we talk about a creation of a new organization or a creation of a new location, we will prioritize those requests. So we have a small um, a smaller uh, SLA, so those requests are handled within five to ten working days. When we talk, for example, about an, a deactivation of a record, this is will be handled as a second priority. So those type of requests they will be handled between ten to fifteen uh, working days. And when we've been talking about change requests, the change request is uh, submitted in the system uh, in the form, in, in this is the form, uh, the format of the form that we have in our system. So there will be some minimum information that the user will have to populate uh, and not, not to forget always to attach uh, the, the supporting documentation. The, uh, the change request uh, update form is fairly similar um, the, the, with the small difference that because we're talking about an update, some information will already be populated um, and any, uh, any relevant uh, uh, information that uh, refers to this update, the user simply type uh, the, where the difference where are the difference if it's either at organization level or location level is just uh, fulfill the, the, the required fields and attaching supporting documentation and submit. 
So we've been talking about uh, supporting documentation. Uh, just to tell you that there is an extensive guidance in our in our OMS portal. There you can find um, what type of supporting documentation to submit per type of change request, not only depending on the type of change request, but also on the jurisdiction, on the country of the organization that um, the record belongs to. So if we're talking an organ, an EEA organization, um, the supporting documentation in this case will be an extract from the local authorities, from the national biz, the local national business registry. Uh, if we talk a public entity, a hospital or a university, we understand those will not be available in uh, the national business registry. And for that reason, a, ha a simple handed letter with the organization and the location details signed and date, this will be sufficient for our validation process. If we're talking a non-EEA organization, um, there is a cascade of documents that can be submitted, um, a document with the, done, with the DUNS number, DUNS being our main source of validation information for non-EEA organizations. We also accept uh, an extract from the National Business Registry, and in case none of those are avail accessible to the user, a headed letter, um, we will, of course, proceed with the validation process, trying to validate the record, but we understand that for some cases, for example, when we talk a manufacturer, uh, imagine we already have a manufacturer uh, in, in the system, uh, but the, the organization is changing buildings. The new address is not available in the business registry, but we're not going to block the user to create the data that he needs for the regulatory procedure. And for the reason, we accept a headed letter, both with organization and location details. Um, available. Um, we've been talking uh, validation and standardization and I would like to share with you here uh, three practical examples on how does this happen at the back end because you've seen uh, the our portal. How do we do uh, as a data steward, how does this all put together? So when a requester submit a change request, um, this is the way it look to our EMA data stewards. So in this case, we're talking an organization, the user submitted a, a certain organization name. He also provided the, the necessary supporting documentation. And with this documentation, we are able to proceed to the validation, okay? So the name is the, is the same. We are able to identify that the name is the same. We go uh, to the local um, business registry. So in this case, we go into the British uh, National Business Registry. We validate that the organization is still active. Uh, once this validation uh, is a pass, we go into the second step, which is standardization. Standardization, this will happen, of course, following, we're not changing the meaning of the data, we're just standardizing the name. And in this case, what we have in our rules is that for a UK company, uh, we will be captured not as LTE, not as LTTD dot, no, the legal entity type, will be captured as, a, as limited. And this is the only change we apply. We're not changing the meaning, we're just standardizing the data. At the end, this is how the name, this is how the organization name will be published in our uh, dictionary. An example on the standardization of a single location. Uh, how does this happen? The same way the requests come via change request to our 
to our portal. So first, always validation. Uh, we validate against the supporting documentation. We attest this against our source systems. We see we can proceed. Is valid is a record is a valid change request. We proceed to the standardization of the data. In this case, uh, we we notice small detail that it does not is not crucial part for the standardization of the address. And this is exactly what the National Postal Service does as part of the standardization. Only location, only relevant location uh, attributes will be displayed in our uh, dictionary. So any other, any other uh, details, in this case we're talking um, another company, it's an organization that is using another company another company's address so uh, no problem there the only the only change that we're going to apply is that we're going to standardize so again we're not changing the meaning we, the meaning is the same we're just standardizing the data last but not least uh, an example on how we maintain and how we create uh, a location with multiple door numbers, especially with the integration with the other GMDP, we've seen uh, a lot of those multiple door addresses. Um, so again, first step, validation. This always happen. Um, and is when we standardize that here, uh, the outcome of the standardization will depend on the information that we have on the National Postal Service. In this case, the National Postal Service does not recognize the street information from number 30 to 36. And what are we gonna do is to tackle this, is we create as many locations, as many door numbers there are, without creating any duplicates. So, um, in, in a practical sense, what we'll see afterwards, if we're doing this, the way it's going to be used in the consuming systems is the user will choose which door number they would like to use. As I said, we will create any other locations that may be needed. And when we talk, for example, Elder GMDP, all any other details, any other relevant information, it may be captured under the certificate remark uh, section. This uh, field is a free text field. Um, last but not least, um, we already touched base on this. Every time there is a rejection, the user will receive a rejection reason code. So a small um, reasoning to uh, why was it rejected and alongside with a tailored comment with a brief justification to why was it rejected and if applicable, further guidance to have the change request successfully approved uh, in our dictionary. Um, just would like to draw your attention to a functionality that we're actually developing as we speak, which is the return functionality. So in RMS, this functionality exists. In OMS, this functionality does not exist yet. Uh, we are developing this and until it's not yet in place, uh, we ask you to please, when you submit a change request, try to not to forget your supporting documentation and try to make sure you added the relevant information um, because you cannot update the change request, you cannot go back. So if you do not provide the supporting documentation or if you do not update the relevant uh, information, the change request, uh, you will have to wait for this first change request to be uh, approved or rejected uh, so that you can resubmit uh, those changes. So at the end, this is always what we want to achieve, which is an approved change request. 
and once uh, we approve a change request, the data is automatically published in our portal and not easily accessible, and it can be used uh, in any uh, consuming system uh, and in any of the OMS consuming systems. Changing now into the OMS uh, project and systems. Uh, where are we? What are we doing? How does this happen? Um, so a DOMS uh, strategy for integration in regulatory procedures happen um, with the inclusion of uh, a new project. Um, so we do this uh, by onboarding and expanding our OMS uh, dictionary, the content. This goes hand in hand with the technical uh, integration. And the aim, of course, is to, to have the OMS being used in all, uh, throughout all the life cycle of the medicinal pro uh, products. And here we can see at the top, we have uh, the representation uh, of the full life cycle of the uh, medicinal product. And um, and the, at the bottom in this uh, in all these bubbles we have um, the regulatory procedures that already are that are already integrated with OMS that we already have in OMS and in here we have two uh, red for example for SME this is still in red because it's part of our plan for this year. Uh, and we should be fully integrated. We aim to have a daily integration uh, with SME. We're not going to replace SME department. We're just going to create a gateway between SME database and all our OMS consuming systems. So the idea is to have um, our dictionary up to date daily um, to have consuming system receiving the latest version of the data. So by now, uh, OMS is already being used, uh, for example, for orphan designation, for scientific advice. Orphan, desig uh, orphan designation was one of one of the first. Um, for uh, the recent uh, mandate use for SA for um, centralized products and. Um, with with the with the integration with the other GMDP, the manufacturers and wholesale distributors already consuming uh, OMS uh, data. So talking uh, system wise, uh, we have now um, multiple EMA systems consuming as OMS data, and uh, or in the pipeline already a few more uh, to come. One of them being uh, Daddy and uh, PMS that they will be consuming uh, OMS uh, data. As part of our integration uh, roadmap, so as I, as I said, I would like just to leave you here some useful links uh, linked uh, with all these project integrations that we have been doing. So very important, some uh, EAF uh, frequent task questions. This was a document that uh, we built together uh, with uh, EAF colleagues and would like to create the same for each of all the other modules that we have so that we can better uh, reach out to all the users and uh, make sure um, we can have a fairly quick integration and there will be no 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 questions uh, w when it gets to the time that you need to use this OMS this OMS data so this is what we have in our plan there we keep an eye on future um, integrations that we may have even though we still do not have a time frame for them but we keep a close eye to make sure we have and we facilitate our users' uh, life with this uh, integration. So some of this, just to highlight 
that some of these systems, uh, and we have marketing authorization holders, applicants and manufacturer already actively using the data in multiple uh, cons OMS consuming systems um, to reinforce that the data, now that they are consuming OMS data, the data will not be a copy of their supporting documentation. Um, we acknowledge that uh, how the OMS data is used in these procedures, this is the biggest challenge. And it's what I was uh, uh, what I was referring. Um, we started putting together a frequent ask questions document for uh, for EAF for centralized uh, product, and uh, with our uh, with the support of our key user group, we aim to to create and to further prepare. Um, more of these documents, more of these practical questions that the user may have uh, on their daily uh, access to all these consuming systems. Um, just to give you here, because sometimes there may be um, a very thin line between what is what is the responsibility of OMS and how can OMS support our users and what until which length can OMS uh, go? Um, so there are two two main points that we would like to to share, which is there are two main roles when we talk about OMS data. So and one of them being how OMS data is managed. So this is whole SPORE operation. And the other one is how OMS data is used uh, in each business process. These are two, uh, they, I know they may seem very similar, but they are two very distinguished roles. And uh, how OMS data is managed. So this lands on EMA data steward uh, responsibility as well, we have other groups supporting us, all of them with their own uh, roles and responsibilities. For example, we've been talking about SPORC user group. This is a very important group in our in our day-to-day -day activities. They help us, they advise us on processes, process improvement, on data, they help us reviewing data quality uh, rules and also uh, improving our IT uh, system always focus on the user experience. So this is all under the scope on how OMS data is managed, how OMS data is used. This is a whole <laughs> discussion. Um, and this lands under the responsibility of the business owners. They are responsible by defining how OMS data will be used in their process. So we OMS will provide the dictionary, how the data is used, it need to be decided business process by business process. Of course, the rules um, and the implementation and all those data requirements, uh, data quality requirements, this is an open discussion, of course, is an ongoing process and uh, we we work with our sport user group uh, that work that may work with other user groups uh, on uh, flagging any business rules that may be required or on any other IT systems that may be relevant uh, for us. So just to show you uh, an example of because we've been talking about OMS and projects and other systems. Uh, I'll just like to show you here an example on what these changes actually mean in this case uh, by showing you the, what the changes mean uh, in Eldre GMDP. So in Eldre GMDP, we had um, NCAs responsible by maintaining and submitting and creating uh, organization and location details in Eldra GMDP. They will be responsible by creating this data. So information applicants and marketing authorization holders will, will fill 
would fill the EAF and this information would uh, would flow. They would also be they could also create the data in OMS, especially because uh, until recently uh, EAF was using uh, OMS a dictionary as an option, but for now, as we've discussed, for centralized procedures, the use is now is now mandatory. Um, with this integration, some of these errors you'll see that they're going to flip a little bit. They're going to change. One of them uh, being that OMS is now becomes the crucial point and the only entry point for organization and location information. This means that both applicants, uh, marketing authorization holders and manufacturers will register the data in OMS um, and only after the data will be accessible and ready to use both in EAF and in the other GMDP. So NCAs can no longer create the data so they will be consuming OMS data directly in the other GMDP. And uh, for example, in, in EAF, uh, there is, and this is what we're doing now relating with the frequent asked questions. This is what we've been doing because uh, for EAF, um, there were no technical uh, uh, changes to the form itself it was more in the sense of the process change. So when we talk of variation in EAF, so the recommendation is the present section, we advise the user and EAF colleagues advise the user to use the manual, uh, the manual process, so to type the details uh, of the present uh, section and on the proposed section to please use the OMS reference to take the data from OMS data because from OMS dictionary because we will have um, we should have that latest version of the data if we do not have then a change request need to be submitted into our dictionary to make sure um, everything is needed because eventually it will be needed in uh, all the internal uh, systems. Now, um, about uh, the future of OMS uh, activities. So, uh, we recently uh, concluded the integration. It was a major work there done on the data cleansing of other GMDP records. Um, uh, and from now on, our uh, main focus will be uh, not only to review um, what we have there, but also to put together some new rules that may be required, which is the example of the, those big plots, those multiple door numbers. We understand that there may be, uh, there is a lot of work to be done in this sense. There is a need of creation of new rules, new processes, we need to have a lot of discussions in this sense. We'll count with the support of the, our key user group to better uh, understand and to create those standards so that we have a process in place and a transparent process in place to be used um, and uh, so that everyone uh, can have a clear view of what we have. Um, after this, we still would like to implement um, what we call it uh, XCV and PD deltas. So this activity is no more than uh, an integration between XCV and PD in OMS. Uh, this means that any record, any organization that will be created in XCV and PD, we want to have them in OMS to make sure um, especially in preparation for the PMS, uh, to make sure that we have all the records that PMS colleagues will need and uh, we have a smooth transition again into the, uh, into the new uh, system to come. And the SME deltas and the integration with the SME database that I've mentioned uh, in the previous slide. All this um, 
as part of the project integration, never forgetting um, our main activities. So we'll continue with our data stewardship and service desk activities. Change requests will continue to be addressed. Um, would like to, especially on the second part of the year, would like to review and to create more of those core cards, more of those rules to make sure <laughs> and to help us uh, maintaining our data quality uh, standards. And in part of the customer experience, so we'll continue uh, creating new documentation. One of them that we have in our pipeline, which is the creation of an OMS data quality management document, where we'll uh, describe in detail how the merge, how the unmerge happen. Uh, the, our OMS FAQs, so uh, this is already published in our dictionary, but is a constant improvement. Is a constant uh, imp improvement. For example, after this session, I'm I'm sure that there will there will be uh, a lot of questions, and we'll integrate them uh, into our current uh, document. Um, and uh, we are today. In this OMS webinar, we plan through in the second part of the year, we plan to deliver uh, another webinar as well as another customer uh, satisfaction uh, survey. Um, and with this, uh, before we go into the questions, just to, I will leave you here a few uh, useful links. Um, so to access our uh, reference documentation, always go to our OMS portal, all the information, all that we have, by now we have an extensive uh, pipeline of documents, so we use them. Um, we have as well, so this, this uh, webinar today was a more overview of our activities. We have another webinar uh, that is more tailored, it's, it goes into more detail into our data quality uh, standards. You can access this content. Today's webinar will also be published um, in the EMA uh, YouTube webpage. You can always reach us through the service desk. Uh, is always another way to get in contact with us. E also leaving you here EMA account management uh, link. This is the platform uh, that manages the access to our users, so also uh, an important step, uh, as well as are the general informations in, uh, in the EMA corporate uh, website. 